In the church, a memorial service is underway bidding farewell to three heirs of Roderick Usher, owner of the pharmaceutical giant Fortunato Pharmaceuticals. The head of the family's eyes betray desperation and fear. Over the past two weeks, he has lost all six of his children, and now he constantly hallucinates their final moments of life. The image of a mysterious lady in a carnival mask haunts him, but no one else present in the church sees her. In his office, Assistant U.S. Prosecutor Auguste Dupont contemplatively examines the investigation board regarding the Usher case. He has long been trying to hold Roderick and his twin sister Madeline accountable for the dubious activities they conduct as leaders of Fortunato. The mysterious demise of all the family heirs plunges the man into a state of confusion, yet he sees a chance to unravel their mystery. Under the cover of night, by invitation of Roderick himself, he arrives at the old abandoned Usher family house. The owner of the decrepit house settles Dupont by the fireplace and promises to reveal all his secrets, including the true circumstances of his heirs' deaths. The assistant prosecutor switches on the recorder, and they delve into Roderick's memories of his incredible past. It all began over 70 years ago in that very house, which was then still filled with life. Roderick and Madeline grew up under the strict control of their single mother, Liz, who was deeply religious. She worked as a personal secretary to the greedy and cruel William Longfellow, who owned the Fortunato Company at that time. The children didn't know their father's name, but for an inexplicable reason, they were always drawn to the Longfellow mansion. One day, curious Madeline persuaded her brother to climb over the fence to sneak into their mother's boss's house. Due to their careless actions, Roderick fell and injured his leg. The commotion in the yard caught the attention of Mrs. Longfellow. At that moment, Liz arrived, preventing the homeowner from speaking to the children. An infuriated Mr. Longfellow reminded the secretary of their agreement, ordering her to leave and not allow the twins near his home again. Since then, hatred for the Longfellow family sprouted in the children's hearts. However, they dared not defy their mother's will, so for the next 10 years, they stayed away from them obediently. But everything changed when Liz fell seriously ill and suffered from endless pain. The devout woman refused medical help, believing that God would heal her. Roderick and Madeline couldn't bear to see their mother suffer. They were old enough to understand who Mr. Longfellow really was and decided to seek his help. Contrary to their hopes, their father was indifferent to Liz's fate and drove the twins away. At dawn, the siblings found their mother's tortured body, showing no signs of life. Frightened, the teenagers decided to secretly bury her in the yard of their own home. That night, a shocking surprise awaited them, Liz, buried alive, emerged from the wooden coffin and burst into the house. Scratched and covered in mud, she attacked Roderick, but stopped at the last moment. Possessed by an unknown force, she headed to the Longfellow house, where in a final burst of strength, she grabbed the throat of the homeowner. The man stopped breathing, and Liz collapsed next to him on the ground. On that rainy night, Roderick and Madeline lost both of their parents. In the present, Roderick concludes his story by revealing that the Longfellow family decided to conceal the true cause of William's death from the public. Thus, no one was ever supposed to know about the illegitimate heirs of the head of the Fortunato company. The prosecutor patiently inquires why he needs to know Liz's story if it's irrelevant to the case. Roderick smirks and says that his mother is currently present in the room and suggests the interlocutor turn around, but he refuses. It's fine with me. At this moment, Roderick's phone receives messages from his granddaughter Lenore, but he ignores them. Dupont is surprised by Roderick's indifference, considering Lenore is the only living Usher heir. Nonetheless, Roderick continues his narrative, shifting back to events from two weeks prior. During that time, Roderick and his family faced accusations in court regarding the opioid epidemic. Despite millions being affected by the company's medication over 40 years, the Usher twins evaded accountability. All evidence and witness testimonies mysteriously disappeared, fueling the pharmaceutical corporation's growth and elevating the Usher family's wealth. Dupont prosecuted the case, aiming to strike a devastating blow to the arrogant family. In his opening statement, he mentioned having an anonymous informant from the Usher family prepared to testify. He kept the informant's identity hidden, sowing discord among the Ushers and waiting for them to turn against each other. Following the court session, Roderick hosted a family dinner, the last time he saw all his heirs alive. Each of his six children possessed unique traits. Freddie, the eldest son, embodied the family's values. His marriage to the talented pastry chef Morel seemed flawless. Together, they raised Lenore, Roderick's beloved granddaughter. Despite lacking business acumen, Freddie strove to win his father's approval, displaying unwavering loyalty. Tamerlane, Freddie's sister on the maternal side, possessed a strong character and knew how to keep her emotions in check. In anticipation of the opening of the Golden Beetle Health Complex, she chose her husband Bill, a charming fitness trainer, as the face of the advertising campaign. Striving for success on her own terms and to impress her father, Tamerlane spared no effort in her work. 
Her relentless activity led to sleep and libido problems, significantly affecting her mental state. Victorine, the eldest among Roderick's illegitimate children, possessed exceptional surgical talents. Thanks to her father's financial support, she and Ali, her colleague and life companion, conducted experiments on monkeys. Their goal was to test an innovative invention, a mechanical heart mesh designed to be an alternative to the human heart. All their experiments ended in failure, with the test subjects passing away on the operating table. To avoid losing funding and to obtain permission for human trials, Victorine concealed the failures from Roderick. Eccentric Camille, another illegitimate daughter of Usher, was in charge of public relations at Fortunato. She skillfully covered up her family's tracks and shaped their impeccable reputation. Possessing information about all the secrets of her brothers and sisters, Camille posed a potential threat to them, as she could use this knowledge to her advantage. Leo, the eldest illegitimate son, was a renowned video game developer suffering from drug addiction. He actively used his popularity and didn't hesitate to cheat on his boyfriend Julius while he was away. Perry was the youngest illegitimate child who recently learned about his influential biological father. Enjoying the newfound wealth, he led a lavish lifestyle, throwing wild parties with illicit substances. Like the rest of the family, he sought recognition from Roderick. Before the start of the dinner party, he presented his business idea to his father and Madeline, a nightclub devoid of restrictions or decency norms. Roderick criticized the idea and refused to allocate funding for the establishment. Although Usher's children were diverse in character, they shared traits of egocentricity, a longing to inherit their father's substantial wealth, and a dislike for his young, slightly eccentric wife, Juno. In the past, Juno struggled with drug addiction and survived a near-fatal accident. A potent dose of painkillers from Fortunato aided her recovery, leading her to perceive Roderick as her savior and become his mistress. According to the Usher twins, every family member could be Dupont's mole, and the dinner party served as a trap for the traitor. As all the heirs and their companions gathered around the table, the Usher family lawyer, Mr. Pym, distributed a non-disclosure agreement to each of them. Madeline cautioned that any breach of this agreement would be tantamount to a death sentence, with no exceptions for relatives. Roderick offered a $50 million reward to whoever disclosed the informant's identity to him. Happy hunting. Returning to the present moment, Roderick shares with Dupont that he is behind the demise of his heirs and mentions a mysterious woman named Verna, who plays a key role in this story. However, for the completeness of the picture, Usher delves back into memories, this time taking his interlocutor back to the distant year of 1979 to reveal the events of that time. Young Roderick lived in modest apartments with Madeline and his first wife, Annabelle. Being a naive and kind-hearted young man, he wrote poetry, inspired by his charming spouse. Annabelle, in turn, reciprocated and supported him, taking care of raising their little ones, Freddie and Tamerlane. Roderick began his career in his father's company, holding the position of a mere clerk. Together with his sister, he harbored a dream of reclaiming his rightful inheritance, leadership in the company. At that time, the company was under the control of the arrogant and greedy Rufus Griswold. Deciding to try his luck, Roderick approached his boss with an innovative proposal, to develop a drug called Legadon, aimed at relieving humanity from pain once and for all. Rufus rejected Roderick's idea, leaving him without support and recognition. However, over time, he took credit for creating Legadon, which sparked righteous anger in Roderick. Madeline, characterized by prudence and practicality, advised her brother to keep his cool and enter Rufus's inner circle, patiently waiting for his moment of glory. Meanwhile, she also presented a business proposal to Rufus, only to endure indecent remarks directed at her. He openly acknowledged her and her brother's status as illegitimate children of Longfellow and sarcastically dismissed their ambitions within the company. Marlene left his office, her gaze suggesting that his laughter would soon fade. During the same period, young Dupont was investigating a series of mysterious exhumations from the graves of participants in clinical trials of new Fortunato drugs. His investigations led him to Roderick, whose name repeatedly appeared in documents and whose signatures were forged. Dupont teamed up with the ushers to obtain the pharmaceutical company's secret documents and expose Rufus's machinations. Thanks to their joint efforts, they managed to gather the necessary evidence, and Roderick was tasked with testifying against his boss in court. However, at the last moment, Usher betrayed Dupont and denied all allegations against Rufus. Since then, the men became sworn enemies, and their confrontation lasted for over 40 years. This moment marked a turning point in Roderick's life. He succumbed to the battle between the light and dark sides of his soul. Influenced by Madeline, he embraced the path of power and destruction. Unable to reconcile with her husband's drastic transformation, kind-hearted Annabelle left him, taking the children with her. Roderick was not long saddened by this. Rufus thanked him for his loyalty to the company and appointed him as his chief advisor. On New Year's Eve, at a costume party, the ushers served Rufus a poison drink. Through cunning, Madeline led Rufus to the basement of the new Fortunato building, 
where she and her brother walled him up in the wall, leaving him there forever. The twins planned to discredit Rufus before the Fortunato board of directors, making it seem like he had fled the country, leaving the company to deal with difficulties alone. In the future, all illegal experiments on the bodies of clinical trial participants would be attributed to him. Meanwhile, Roderick, who temporarily diverted the attention of federal agents, would become a hero in the eyes of the board of directors and would take over as the company's leader. To ensure a reliable alibi, the twins went to the nearest bar, where they met the charming bartender, Verna. A night conversation filled with secrets with the stranger drastically changed the lives of Roderick and Madeline Usher. At the present moment, elderly Roderick insists that every detail of his story is crucial, and Dupont must listen to it to the end. In his memories, there is a moment when, leaving the church after the memorial service, he sees the image of his first victim, Rufus, dressed in a jester costume from that same costume party. Roderick collapses in a faint, and upon seeing a crow on the fence, he begins to unconsciously repeat. This time. This time. The first victim in a series of mysterious deaths was the youngest heir of the Usher household, Perry. A rebellious youth, unwilling to accept his father's refusal, decided to throw an exclusive masquerade party in the abandoned Fortunato Laboratory building. He sent invitations to well-known and influential personalities with the aim of gathering compromising material on them through hidden cameras, and then passing it on to Roderick. According to his plan, water was supposed to pour down on the guests from the rooftop reservoirs at the peak of the event, signaling the start of debauchery. In an attempt to humiliate his arrogant brother Freddy, Perry invited his spouse, Morel, to the party. Tired of the fake family bliss, the woman secretly attended the event. Suddenly, Verna appeared in the building, dressed in a provocative red costume. Incredibly, after 40 years, she looked as if time had stopped for her. She seduced the young usher and warned him that every action has its consequences. Confident Perry didn't take the stranger's words seriously, which he soon regretted. Verna urged the waiters and Morel to leave the building immediately, but the woman didn't heed her advice. Liquid was released into the hall, which turned out to be acid, burning Perry's and the party guests' bodies to the bone. Before the boy drew his final breath, Verna kissed him and placed the masquerade mask on his face. Roderick confesses to Dupont that he hid the acid in the reservoirs, aiming to avoid fines for violating environmental standards. Frederick, on the other hand, due to his negligence, didn't dismantle the building in time, which could have prevented Perry's demise. In the wake of the tragedy that befell the Usher family, they faced the necessity of concealing all the details of what happened to preserve their reputation. This task fell upon Camille, who for the first time decided to act against the family's will. Being an illegitimate child, just like Perry, she understood his desire to gain recognition from their father by any means necessary. She decided to evoke public sympathy for her departed brother. Collaborating with Leo, Camille planned to use his popularity for her PR campaign. Simultaneously, the girl kept an eye on her sister, Victorine, suspecting her of colluding with Dupont. In the course of her investigation, Camille discovered that the animal experiments conducted by her sister yielded unexpected results. Victorine concealed these facts from their father, subjecting the test monkeys to cruel torture. Under the cover of night, Camille sneaked into Victorine's laboratory at the hospital with the aim of recording video evidence of her sister's actions to present to their father. There, Camille encountered Verna, who disguised herself as a security guard. Like a predator, Verna began to corner Camille, explaining that their feud with her sister was pointless. She pointed out that both sisters made the wrong choices. Camille had silently covered up her family's crimes for years in exchange for money, while Victorine created the illusion of piety, aiming for her artificial heart to save many lives. However, in reality, she ruthlessly destroyed innocent animals without the slightest remorse. Assuming the form of a chimpanzee, Verna attacked Camille, making her the next victim among the usher heirs. Having suffered another loss, Madeline and Roderick instructed Mr. Pym to investigate what had happened. In both cases, he discovered a mysterious stranger on the video camera recordings whose identity couldn't be determined. Meanwhile, Roderick asked Victorine about Camille's visit to her laboratory. She informed her father of Camille's intentions to conduct experiments on humans. Roderick enthusiastically welcomed this news, as he had a heart condition that had claimed his mother's life. His daughter's experimental program could be his only chance to prolong his life, and he promised Victorine financial support. Leo, saddened by the loss of his siblings, hosted a noisy party at home with the use of banned substances. Waking up in the middle of the night, he was horrified to find Pluto, his boyfriend Julius's beloved cat, mutilated on the floor. Thinking that he might have harmed the animal in a drug-induced state, Leo decided to conceal the evidence of the crime and told his partner that the cat had run away. Subsequently, seeking to atone for his guilt, Leo visited an animal shelter where he encountered Verna, who volunteered there. His attention was drawn to a black cat that remarkably resembled Pluto. Taking a photo of Verna and the new pet, Leo compared it to images of Julius's beloved cat. Astonished by their striking resemblance, he took the cat from the shelter. 
However, Leo's relief from replacing Pluto was short-lived. The new cat began causing him trouble and provoking bouts of aggression. It seemed that the animal intentionally drove Leo to madness, leaving the remains of small rodents in his belongings and on the bed. Julius, concerned about his partner's mental state, feared that Leo was hooked on banned substances. Unable to tolerate the abuse from the black cat, Leo called Verna to the house with the intention of returning the animal to her. Verna convinced him that Pluto was hiding within the walls of the house, waiting for the moment to attack. When the cat lunged at Leo, during a fierce struggle, Leo squeezed the animal's eye. Verna suffered the same injury, but then she and the cat dissolved into thin air. Under the influence of powerful psychotropic substances, Leo completely lost his mind. When Julius returned home, he found that his partner, in a state of madness, had demolished the walls of their apartment, trying to find Pluto. With a manic gleam in his eyes, Leo stared into one of the cracks, claiming to see Verna's body within it. He tried to point it out to Julius, but Julius saw nothing but an empty wall. Spotting the cat on the balcony railing, Leo screamed and lunged towards it. Stop! Next to Leo's lifeless body appeared the real Pluto. Thus, Roderick Usher lost his third heir. However, the loss of his children wasn't the old man's biggest problem. His health sharply deteriorated, leading to the emergence of ominous hallucinations. Roderick deemed it necessary to share his diagnosis with his sister. After this, Madeline began to pressure Victorine, urging her to immediately start clinical trials of the heart implant on humans. Fortunately for her, Verna, in the guise of a woman suffering from heart disease, turned to the hospital for help. She consented to participate in the clinical trials. Taking advantage of the moment, Victorine falsified her colleague Ali's signature to obtain permission for the surgery. Upon discovering this deception, Ali was outraged and declared a rupture of relations with Victorine. Meanwhile, the relationships between Roderick's remaining children became increasingly strained. Each of them sought to prove their superiority and win their father's favor. Currently, Dupont confesses to Usher that he fabricated the informant story to pit family members against each other. Against the backdrop of stress caused by the breakup with her beloved and attempts to gain approval from her father, Victorine began to hear ticking sounds everywhere. Roderick decided to visit his daughter to share news about his health. He found Victorine in a state of hysteria, constantly repeating about the ticking sounds. Following his daughter into the room, Roderick was horrified to discover Ollie's lifeless body with an open chest cavity, revealing a heart implant inside. Victorine recalled the evening of the argument with her beloved. Before leaving, Ali promised to uncover the secrets of the Usher family, even if it cost her career. In a fit of anger, Victorine threw a heavy book stand at her, injuring the back of her head. Frightened by the potential consequences, Victorine did not seek help but decided to implant Ali with an experimental heart mesh, hoping to make her a new test subject. All this time, she believed that her beloved was still alive. Realizing that her experiment had failed and she hadn't lived up to her father's expectations, Victorine pierces her chest with a knife. Trying to ignore yet another tragic death in the family, Tamerlane fully immersed herself in her work. She had a peculiar way of relaxation, deriving pleasure from watching her husband stage a spectacle of familial harmony with an escort. On one such evening, Verna arrived at their home in response to a call, transformed into a redhead beauty strikingly resembling Tamerlane. The intriguing interaction between Verna and Bill not only excited Tamerlane but also aroused feelings of jealousy. Subsequent events led her to suspect that Verna was deliberately trying to seduce her husband, pursuing him at every turn. Sleepless nights spent preparing for the presentation of the Golden Beetle, combined with growing suspicions, pushed Tamerlane to the brink of exhaustion and madness. In a fit of anger, she insulted Bill, calling him shallow and stating that she only chose him for his looks. These accusations were the final straw that shattered their relationship. During the investigation of the mysterious incidents that befell the Usher family, Madeline made a remarkable discovery. She found that the mysterious woman appearing in the affairs of Roderick's deceased children bore a striking resemblance to Verna, the bartender they celebrated the new year with in 1980. Meanwhile, Mr. Pym uncovered evidence linking Verna to well-known and influential personalities whose history spans hundreds of years. Madeline tried to convince her brother that Verna posed a serious threat to their family, but he didn't take her warning seriously. Obsessed with the desire for immortality, she tasked her scientific team with using advancements in artificial intelligence to develop a method for transferring consciousness into a virtual dimension. During the presentation of the Golden Beetle Health Complex, Tamerlane was overcome by panic, leading to hallucinations. Among those present in the hall, she saw Verna wearing a dress identical to her own. Then Tamerlane seemed to see scenes on the screen showing intimate encounters between her and Bill with an escort. In a fit of hysteria, she forcefully threw a microphone stand into the hall accidentally injuring Juno. Madeline, noticing Verna among the stunned audience, attempted to grab her, but the mysterious woman turned to ashes right in her hands. Distraught by the presentation's failure, Tamerlane returned home. 
Verna cruelly mocked the tormented woman, using reflections in the numerous mirrors of the house. Tamerlane tried to strike her pursuer by smashing one mirror after another. At the peak of her despair, Tamerlane struck the glass ceiling of her bedroom, causing a rain of shards to fall upon herself. Freddy remained the sole surviving heir of Usher. He went through a difficult period after learning that his beloved wife, Morel, had attended Perry's debauched party. She miraculously survived the catastrophe, but her body was disfigured by burns. Bringing his wife home, Freddy promised their daughter, Lenore, that he would find the best doctors to restore Morel's health. However, amidst feelings of betrayal and his own dependency on Lee Dagon, he cruelly mistreated Morel, subjecting her to physical and psychological violence. Meanwhile, Juno approached Roderick, asking him to abstain from using Lee Dagon. In response, Usher candidly admitted that his decision to marry was not driven by love but by her body's ability to absorb the drug. With irony in his voice, he predicted that Juno would face excruciating withdrawal and serious side effects without access to the drug, given her dependency. Deeply disappointed by her husband's true nature, Juno decided to leave him. Lenore was troubled by her father's unusual behavior and his adamant refusal to allow her to see her mother. Taking advantage of the moment when Freddie left the house, she resolutely sneaked into Morel's room. Horrified to find her in a terrible state, the girl called the police to their home. Freddy arrived at the building where Perry's tragedy occurred, on the eve of its demolition. Inhaling cocaine, he suddenly lost consciousness. Verna appeared in the room, dressed in work overalls, and lay down next to Freddy. She confessed that she was the one who persuaded Freddy to mix Morel's paralyzer with cocaine. Verna noted that she could have chosen a less painful end for Freddy but deemed it necessary to teach him a lesson for his mistreatment of his wife. The demolition of the building began, and the collapsing structures formed a pendulum that slowly but inevitably pierced Freddy's body, splitting him in two. He felt every movement but was unable to budge. As a final word, Verna told Freddy that it was time for her to meet his father. Having lost his last child, crushed by grief, Roderick went to the basement of Fortunato, where he committed his first crime. There, he was found by Madeline, who reminded him of the deal they made with Verna many years ago. She convinced her brother to take a critical dose of Ligadon and sacrifice his life for her salvation. Roderick agreed and fell unconscious. Leaving him alone, Madeline indifferently left the room. In the basement, Verna appeared, dressed in all black. She brought Roderick back to life and told him that their debt was not fully paid yet. The man returned to his office and learned that the board of directors had removed him from his position in favor of Madeline. In the present, Roderick moves to the concluding chapter of his story. The tale of losing his children, being deprived of power, and the debilitating illness that plagued him didn't leave Dupont indifferent. However, his thirst for retribution for all the sins of the Usher family remained unquenched. Roderick convinces his sworn enemy that he will receive exactly what he came for. At the end of the final memorial service, Roderick beholds the image of Annabelle, grieving for her children. She accuses her ex-husband of bearing responsibility for the tragic fate of Freddie and Tam Orlin. He intruded into their lives, purchasing their loyalty and separating them from their mother. This recurring pattern extended to his interactions with all his children, ultimately leading them to become monsters. Weakened and unconscious at the doorstep of the church, Roderick sank into memories of the New Year's Eve of 1980. On that magical night, the mysterious and alluring Verna presented him and his sister with an unusual proposal. She promised them wealth, power, and protection from all adversity in exchange for the lives of all their future descendants. At the end of it all, just before you would have died, Roderick. Just before you would have died, anyway. Your bloodline dies with you. Roderick agreed to the proposal without the slightest hesitation. Right after the deal was sealed, the twins stepped out of the bar, which mysteriously disappeared right before their eyes. Verna kept her word, the ushers gained everything they could dream of. Madeline took the terms of the agreement seriously and consciously gave up the opportunity to have children. Meanwhile, Roderick showed recklessness by engaging in romantic relationships with various women. When Verna returned to life, Madeline did everything possible to find a loophole to bypass the deal's conditions. For this reason, she compelled her brother to take lead poison, but failed. Verna reminded her that twins born on the same day were also meant to leave this world together. Madeline persisted and sent Mr. Pym to rid them of the persistent pursuer. The lawyer couldn't defeat the mystical creature, but he accepted his defeat with dignity. Verna reminded him of his past transgressions and offered to make a deal, promising immunity in return. But Mr. Pym rejected her offer, choosing to end his life on his own terms. He took responsibility for all his crimes and was sentenced. Verna appeared before Lenore, who decided to stay in her grandfather's house to take care of him. With regret, 
she informed Lenore that she had to take the life of an innocent girl, the most pure-hearted of all Usher's descendants. Before carrying out her intention, Verna tried to console Lenore, assuring her that her mother would recover and establish a charitable foundation in her honor, saving hundreds of lives. The girl silently leaves this world, and her lifeless body is discovered by Roderick. In the present, with tears in his eyes, the old man confesses to Dupont that the messages coming to his phone during their conversation are from artificial intelligence. Earlier, Madeline enlisted Lenore to create a chatbot, which is now activated and messaging Roderick. Several hours before their meeting, realizing his time had come to an end, the man arrived in Fortunato to bid farewell to his empire. Ghosts of his children watched his actions. Approaching the window, he witnessed an unusual sight, people falling from the sky to the ground like rain. Verna, unexpectedly appearing behind him, explained that all these people are victims of Fortunato's production. She ordered Roderick to contact Dupont and confess to all the crimes committed. Before his fateful outcome, Usher invited Madeline to their ancestral family home for a final conversation, during which he poisoned her drink. Remembering his sister's desire to be preserved for eternity, he embalmed her body in the manner of ancient pharaohs and replaced her eyes with precious sapphires. Dupont, horrified, realizes that the strange sounds coming from the basement all evening belong to Madeline. She turns out to be alive, freed from her grave. Blind and consumed by madness, she begins to strangle her brother, reminiscent of their mother. The old building begins to collapse, and Dupont manages to escape onto the street at the last moment. The Usher house falls with the last members of this unusual family. In the story's conclusion, Dupont decides to retire, thereby putting an end to the case he had been working on for many years. Juno, becoming the sole heir of the Ushers, decides to dissolve Fortunato and instead establishes a foundation for the rehabilitation of lead poisoning victims. Verna visits the cemetery, where she leaves symbolic items on the Usher graves. Quoting lines from Edgar Allan Poe's poem The Spirits of the Dead, she puts a period on their story. How do you think things would have turned out for the ushers if they had made different decisions in their lives? Roderick had the opportunity to preserve his family and become a modest poet, but would he have been happy in doing so? Write in the comments below, would you make a deal with Verna or choose a different path? Don't forget to hit the like button.